All right. We are about to get this live stream on its way. Uh, hopefully you guys are able to uh, see my screen here. If you can, uh, welcome. Let me know in the uh, chat room where you guys are watching from. I'm going to switch over here to my camera in a few moments, but I'll give everybody a few minutes to uh, join in on the live stream. And uh, I'm going to share this as well. So if you guys want to hang on here. There we go. Let me know how you guys hear me here. I've got kind of a different setup going today. Got my, uh, I'm going to be live streaming off of my laptop and I've got this like really sweet Rode microphone that I'm using for the first time. So hopefully I sound okay, even though I'm sure I sound a little bit congested. This winter has been kicking my butt. It's crazy. Let's see. Here we go. All right. Got some messages coming through here. So we got Steve Sanchez, who's waiting, waiting, waiting. You don't have to wait any longer. We're here. <laughs> Mo Jones, New Jersey in the house. What up? Josh, Josh Luciano. What up? How's it going? It's Mac from San Francisco. How's it going? We've got Richard from the Netherlands. Welcome. Eugenio. Uh, Mo says there's a little bit of reverb. but you guys hearing that as well? I can kind of play around with my settings here if I need to. And then let me know what you guys see on the screen. Are you guys seeing a uh, photograph and uh, my screen from Capture One on the screen? Steve Sanchez watching from Morristown. Dang, you're like right down the road. LeVar watching from Philly. All right, so he says there's a little bit of reverb. Let's see if I can tweak these settings a little bit. Let me know if that helped out with the audio. I just lowered it down a little bit. We're going to be working through this. I've got a kind of like a brand new live stream setup that I'm going to be testing out here pretty soon. Um, but uh, I figured before I did all of that, since it's kind of a snow day and I can't get to the studio, I would just stream from my house. Just going to make it work today. Should be fun. Let me know if you guys are just joining the stream, uh, where you guys are watching from. And uh, let's see, I'm going to share this right now on good old Facebook. If you guys have any photography friends that you think might uh, enjoy watching this, do me a favor and share the stream as well. Let's see, so we'll put streaming now. All right, and post. All right, so we're good. All right, so going back to the chat here, we've got Jonathan in O-Town. What's going on? See my screen from Capture One, which is perfect. Uh, Diana in Minnesota. Yeah, bird watching, I know. It's kind of like that here too. It's kind of been snowing off and on, but uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, making its way around. Uh, Godwin from Ghana. Welcome, welcome. Uh, Antion was asking if I'm going to WPPI. I definitely will be at WPPI. We've got some exciting stuff happening there too, so uh, stay tuned. Let's see, Avis or Ivis uh, watching from Latvia. Welcome. Uh, Steven says, use your method for posing, getting the person in character. How did it go? Let me know. Mac is <laughs> he's getting ready for that Q mode. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, Ashley, welcome, welcome. I'm going to switch over to my camera here for a moment so I can chat with you guys. Uh, can you guys see me? It's kind of a funky uh, camera because I'm using the webcam on my laptop. But um, yeah, for the next live stream that I do, I'm actually going to have like my Sony cameras, like a good camera as the webcam. So you guys will be able to see this glorious mug in, you know, <laughs> 1080 HD instead of, uh, I don't know, I think it's like 720p, so it's kind of crazy. But um, what we're going to be doing today is I'm going to show you, figured instead of like doing what I would be doing right now by myself, which is kind of going through images and figuring out which ones I like and which ones I would like to have, um, you know, published and, and retouched and put out into the world, I would kind of have you guys watch. And in that process, you could ask me questions, um, 
you know, all of that good stuff. So I want to thank my sponsor who was able to make this happen, the folks at uh, Phase One. They have a product called Capture One, which I have been using for years. If you guys have watched me, you know, watch my videos, you guys probably already know that I've been using Capture One for a very, very long time. Uh, I believe it to be the most powerful raw processing software out there. So uh, if you guys are using Lightroom and you're sick of the weird performance issues and just having to uh, take forever to work on your images on Lightroom, uh, definitely check out Capture One. I put a link in the description of this video. Um, I don't get any kickbacks via that link, so I'm just putting it there for you guys to go to it and to uh, download it and check it out. You can get a free trial. I believe it's a 30-day free trial. So uh, download it, install it if you want to uh, kind of follow along with your own images or if you want to follow along so you can ask questions along the way, definitely do that. And uh, yeah, so let's get started. I'm gonna turn off my camera here. We'll go back to Capture One. Uh, I'm gonna take a look at the um, questions on the chat as well as we kind of go along the way and then uh, we'll kind of get going here. So um, let's see, Wendy, how's it going? Welcome to the stream. Uh, Mo says in Times Square on my way to Grand Central. Uh, it will be all audio for me. Good, good, it'll be all right. Luckily, this is going to be recorded, so um, yeah, you'll be able to watch this a little bit later. Uh, let's see. Steven says that a shoot, he tried out the posing technique that I taught him. He says it went super well. Uh, really, I've been waiting for a video like that. Thanks for the quick breakdown on the posing. You're quite welcome. I'm glad to hear that it worked for you. I actually have another series of videos on that same topic that's going to be coming out soon. Um, you know, really, I'm just waiting to get my voice back. I don't know if it sounds strange to you guys but um man it's been a really crazy winter my uh my voice has been taking a whooping so uh, let's see van was asking uh what's your favorite portrait camera a7 III or a7 r3 uh personally i mean i use my a7 r3 quite a bit but to be honest with you guys as far as portraiture goes um really whatever camera that you have is going to do just fine you know so if you have even like an a6000 I mean, you could take fantastic portraits with that. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to be the one to tell you you got to go like crazy and just buy like the most expensive stuff. Uh, you know, you buy whatever your your budget would allow. But if I have to choose between the two, which I own both, I tend to use the A7R3 quite a bit more because of the resolution and uh, because of the resolution. <laughs> All right. So... Um, Let's see, just kind of going through the rest of the comments here before we get started. Uh, Brandon was asking, how do you use one of Sony cameras as the capture? Uh, would you need a capture card to get the video footage? I'm actually doing a video on that. Um, so basically, you would need a capture card, and uh, you need a uh, software program that allows you to do the, uh, the live stream and that captures the footage. So it's kind of a, a, an involved setup. So, so that's why, why I figured instead, instead of trying to explain it, I'll just make a video and uh, show you, you know, show you exactly how it's done. Let's see. Uh, Antion was asking, can you use the iPad with Capture One to call images? Uh, I don't believe so. Uh, you would need to use your Mac or your uh, your PC because it is a pretty involved, <laughs> pretty powerful program. Uh, so yeah, definitely want to do it on that. Uh, let's see. Eugenio was saying that he loves Capture One tethering. Man, when it comes to tethering, that's really like, that's it. You know, that's that's really what it's all about. Uh, any Mac was asking if there's any differences moving from version 11 to 12. I actually just recently moved to 12, so I'm going to have to table that question because at this point, it's very similar, especially for my workflow. But um, you know, there's always new features and stuff that when they add it, I tend to get around to checking it out, and then once I start using it it's really hard to uh, go back. So uh, I'm going to table that. So let's see. Uh, Cosmo Gang was saying, I really prefer on one photo raw to capture one, but it means my computer wants to explode. So I may go back to capture one again. Uh, what was the last version of capture one that you used? I would tell you um, I've used on one before. I've used various other uh, raw programs or raw processing programs. And honestly, like the total package for me, I found it in capture one. So uh, definitely give it a try if you if it's been a while. Uh, let's see, scrolling back down here. Uh, I'll come back to the questions actually. So uh, let's see. Uh, let's go back here. 
Okay, so a few of you are saying the reverb is back. So hang on. Let's see. All right, tell me if that's a little bit better now. Uh, hopefully, you're not getting as much reverb. I think what it is, is if I speak really close to the microphone, that's when you're hearing it. So let me know if that sounds a little bit better on your end. Uh, I'll go through some questions here in the meantime, again, before we get started. Uh, let's see. So uh, K Para Pixels was asking, do you editing your beauty shots in Capture One Pro from A to Z only? Uh, no. That is uh, usually not the case. What I'll do is uh, I'll process the raw file in Capture One, and then a lot of the skin retouching and things of that nature, I do it in Photoshop. Now, it is possible for you to do uh, quite a bit, actually, in Capture One. Uh, I'm working on that workflow, but right now I'm getting, uh, I basically will take the photos from Capture One into Photoshop, and I'll finish it off there. So let's see. Uh, let's see. So <clears throat> looks like some people are saying that it's still echoey. So let's take a look and see. I'm going to keep adjusting some of the settings here. Hopefully it gets a little better. All right. So um, Jose was asking, do you know if there would be any improvement in Capture One speed if I increase my RAM from 8 to 16 gigs? Um, I, I would imagine so, to be honest with you. I mean, I don't know. I, I think that uh, as far as like improving your, your machine, probably what would be better is if you work on a program and basically have your uh, other programs closed down. So hopefully that could help out. Like I've got a machine that basically had eight gigs of RAM before and I was able to run Capture One without too much of an issue. But of course, you know, as time goes on, like the machine I'm on now has 32 gigs and the big workstation that hopefully I'll have working at 100%, um, that machine has 128 gigs. So, I mean, I could run anything and everything, and it works perfectly fine. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, usually increasing your RAM helps out quite a bit. So, Max says, uh, the sound is manageable. I would just move ahead with the live stream. All right, cool. Well, let's do it. All right, so you guys are watching my screen right now. You guys can see I've got uh, Capture One pulled up here. And um, so I'm going to kind of thumb through it. I'm going to show you guys how kind of like the way that Capture One is set up. And then I'll tell you basically how I go about selecting my images here. So on the left hand side, uh, basically whenever I do a photo shoot, I will create a new session, which you would go up to file and new session. And so when you create that new session, it will create a folder that basically has a capture folder. So it's going to be under January 30 shoots, which is what I call the uh, folder. Uh, I'll probably end up changing that a little bit later. But under that folder, there'll be four folders. You'll have capture folder, selects folder, output location, and trash folder. All of the images, once you hit this little import images icon, all the images will go into the capture folder. So if you're wondering where your photos are at after they're imported, you would go to whatever the session name is. And of course, just go to the capture folder and all of your raw photos will be in that folder. Now, on the left side here, I've got this filters tab open. You're going to notice there's 279 images and you'll see one star to five stars. And those all say zero. So right now, all of the photos that I'm going to show you, none of them have actually been rated. Um, so what I will end up doing is I go through all of the photos relatively quickly. And what I'll end up doing is I'll assign them a star rating. So I'll start off giving it a one star. Then I go to the one star images, which of course there's none selected just yet, but basically it'll cut down those 279 images down to, I don't know, honestly, like in the beginning, uh, if I had 279 images, my goal is to really cut it down to maybe like 30 to 40. And then from there, cut it down on the two stars to three to four to five. Finally at five stars, that's actually what I'm, you know, working on to get uh, published out on the web or to deliver to the client. So uh, that is basically how I go about doing that. But let's take a look at the images. And what's kind of cool here is that I get a lot of people asking about kind of like seeing the raw files and what they look like. And you guys will have the opportunity here to actually see what the uh, raw files look like coming straight out of my camera. The other thing you guys are going to see here is um, 
kind of like my light tests. So usually when I get to the studio and as soon as the model's makeup is ready, uh, I have them come and stand in. I set the lights up kind of as best as I can without the model actually being you know, ready to be photographed. And then I'll start to tweak my lights from there. So I'll tweak the power settings, um, you know, all, all of that good stuff. Uh, Mac was asking in the comments here, can you show the history, please? Uh, which history? What, what do you mean? Oh, histogram. All right, so I'm going to change this here. I'm going to change this view so you guys can see. So now up in the left-hand corner, you guys will see the uh, histogram here. Hopefully that'll help you guys out. And you guys will also see my settings for each of the photos. So right underneath the histogram, you'll see ISO 100, 1 160th of a second, F10. And uh, if you wanted to see the actual metadata for the images, if you click on this eye icon and you scroll down, or actually, yeah. So you can see here, it was the Sony FE 100 mil, uh, shot this on the Sony A7R III. You can see all the rest of the settings and all that good stuff in the uh, metadata. But anyway, we'll go back to the exposure tab. If you guys want to see the histogram, it's up there. All right, so let's start going through these images here. Um, that first shot that I took, I was kind of going for a uh, almost like a natural light type of look. And unfortunately, it was just like, it was bright. <laughs> So I kind of tweaked the uh, lighting from there. So I'm just going to go through these images as I would. And so you'll notice straight away, like the first few shots, I did it on white. And I wasn't really too crazy how it looked. So then I switched it out to black. And uh, on black, I actually liked the way it looked a little bit better. The lighting was looking kind of interesting. So I started tweaking the uh, power settings on the lighting. So you can see from here. I was way off on the lighting, kind of went here. So let's go back down. All right, so then I kind of settled in on my uh, power settings. I was at F14, 1 one sixtieth of a second, ISO 100. And that's where I started to find my uh, groove with these images. So I'm going to zoom in on a couple of these just to show you guys, because again, uh, many of you are asking about the uh, raw photos and you want to see what they look like before they're retouched. That's kind of why I thought you guys might enjoy kind of sitting in with me as I go through these images and try to figure out which ones I want to have retouched. But uh, you can see that at F14, there's a lot of detail. I mean, there's a ton of detail. And if you want to scroll around here, um, this little hand up here, it says pan. Uh, you can grab the image and kind of scroll around. So You'll notice at F14, there's just a lot of detail in these shots, lots of skin detail. So uh, you want that when you're trying to do beauty shots or you're trying to do portraits and you want to get, you know, the maximum amount of detail. People oftentimes will think that you have to like paint detail in Photoshop or something like that. And it's definitely not the case. Like the texture has to be there. The skin detail has to be there. And then, you know, of course, this is a raw file that you're looking at. So in post-production through Capture One, through Photoshop, you're able to kind of fix uh, color issues. You're able to fix, you know, different texture issues and things of that nature. So uh, looking at the comments here really briefly, um, Wendy was saying, I'm so naive to the whole Capture One thing. Is it that it works with RAW, that it tethers? How is it different from Bridge and Adobe Camera Raw? Uh, it's very similar to uh, to Adobe Camera Raw in a way, but it's more powerful. You do have the ability to tether, and the tethering I think is probably the like the big time thing for me because I, I do tether quite a bit in the studio. But um, the other thing too is just that it does a really, really good job with processing raw files. What I've personally noticed is even when I shot with Canon back in the day, if I open up a raw file in Lightroom and then I open up a, a raw file in Capture One, Generally speaking, it takes less to get a decent looking result out of Capture One than it does out of Lightroom. So if you're the type of person that you like to spend a lot of time, uh, you know, in Lightroom, in your images, uh, tweaking sliders and stuff like that to get just like a baseline decent raw photo, then, you know, Lightroom's your thing. If you don't want to spend your time doing those things and you want a raw file that looks pretty good, 
uh, just right out of the gates, I think Capture One is going to be the program for you. So what I would recommend to you, I have a link in the description for this video. Again, it's not like an affiliate link or anything like that. Uh, I don't get any type of kickbacks, but you can download the Capture One program. It's free for 30 days. Test it out. I would tell you, open up the raw file in both programs and just compare one to the other. And uh, you'll you'll have a better idea. Uh, Mac was asking if I use eye autofocus or manual focus because I would think at f14 it won't see the eye. Uh, it definitely sees the eye. I mean, I've shot way higher than that and it still sees the eye just fine. I did use eye autofocus for all of these. And generally speaking, I mean, I use eye autofocus these days probably like, I don't know, 98% of the time. So whether I'm shooting wide open or I'm shooting uh, studio images like this, I would still use it. So um, let's see, MM was saying that the first one with the black background is great. It should be a one rating. Let's go back. Uh, let's, let's see which one you're talking about. Uh, so the first one with the black background was this one. Was this one you're talking about? Zoom in here. And you guys could also see too, which is kind of cool. Um, this is with the 100 millimeter STF lens. You, I mean, it's so detailed. <laughs> so incredibly detailed. You could actually see my lighting setup in the eyes. So um, I actually did a live stream from the studio like while this photo shoot was happening and I talked about the lighting setup. So after this uh, video, if you want to check out that live stream, you could see basically what the setup was. But essentially it was just a white V-flat and I had a pro photo, I think it was a D2 inside of a beauty dish and it was bouncing off the ceiling. And then, of course, some of it was reflecting off the V-flat. And then also had a silver reflector below, which you can see here in the catch light. So uh, I'm going to give this one a one rating because I, I do kind of agree. I did like the expression on that. Uh, so we'll, we'll go through these kind of briefly. And all I'm going to do is just have I've got my right hand on the arrow key. And I've got the uh, my left hand over the number one. And I'm kind of just going through these, and if I see an expression that kind of jumps out at me, then I just push the number one. I don't think about it too much. I'm not trying to see if the photo is in focus or anything like that, because I'll do that at a different step. Um, but really, all I'm trying to do is to try, and try to find the photos that have a great expression. Now, this is an example, and this is one photo that I'll, I'll kind of like call out here. So if you see this photo, you notice like the face is really overexposed. And if you click this little exposure warning, uh, it's a little triangle with an exclamation mark up on the right, top right side, you'll notice straight away that if I click that, you're going to see all this red stuff, right? And if I increase the exposure some more, you'll see that red will spread. Red spread is not good. That means all of those pixels that you're seeing there have no detail. They're just pure white pixels. So here's what's really cool. With the a7r3 because it has pretty awesome dynamic range you could actually recover detail in the shadows and the highlights relatively easily now i'm not going to tell you to make a habit of overexposing or underexposing your photos just because you know you could fix them in post-production later you should be trying to get a decent exposure every time but this is a photograph that if i like the expression i could just basically lower the exposure and all of a sudden we have we have a photo. Like, I, I kind of dig her expression. Uh, again, I'm not going to think too much into it at this part of the process. I'm just going to go and uh, give this one a one. And we'll just keep arrowing down. So I'll give that one a one. We changed the exposure so you could see that the lighting went from a little bit brighter to darker. Uh, this is the same type of thing, you know, on these photos. You notice here on the histogram that on the right-hand side, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of room. So, so I could actually raise this exposure afterwards. So again, I'm really just looking at that expression. Is it an expression that I like? Um, that's a one. That's a one. That's a one. That's a one. Now, what you don't want to do, and this happens a lot more in the beginning uh, of your, your, your process as you uh, are kind of like training your eyes to see what's good and what's not, what you don't want to do is to like go and just like go through these images and just be like one, 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 you know, 
then you end up with like, if we had 279 photos to start off with, you have like 260 photos with a one star rating that kind of defeats the purpose of, uh, of doing this. So what you want to do is really like kind of be, be a little bit picky about the shots. If the expression isn't like knocking you out of your chair, then just skip it. All right. So I'll give that a one like that one. Kind of like that. So again, I'm just looking at the expression here. Um, not looking to see if these images are in focus or anything like that. Uh, let's see. That's good. So we'll go through these relatively quickly, and then uh, I'll take some questions, and then we'll go to the two stars. And then I'll show you some close-ups. I'll show you basically what I do at that uh, first cutting phase. Let's turn off this warning here. So here we changed from a black B flat and I switched over to a Savage. Um, I forgot the color of this background. I'll have to let you guys know a little bit later, but switched over to a Savage seamless background. And as you can see, when I switched over my lighting, this exposure was way bright. But again, because you have pretty awesome dynamic range, you can overexpose an image and you could still recover that in post-production. So it's pretty easy. So kind of looking through these, I like that one. We made it a little bit darker here, still playing around with the lights. Now what would have been easier at this point in time is if I would have metered my lights, I wouldn't have had to do this back and forth thing. But you could tell that within like three shots, I pretty much landed it at the exposure that I wanted to use. So I basically just looked at each of the images and as I shot them, I'm like, do I like the way the light looks or not? And if I do, great. And if not, then just keep it moving. All right, so going through these here, again, just kind of looking at the expressions, looking at the crop, I like that one. Uh, then I change the light here again. So again, here I'm playing with the lighting. So here's how many shots it takes for me to basically like land on the actual exposure that I want. So we changed here. That was the first shot. There's the second. There's the third. There's the fourth. And from there on, we're ready to go. So really within like three photos, I can get to where I need to be. And the cool thing is too, so all the, uh, I played around with the settings here. You could see... I went from F11 to <laughs> F11 to F8, and then I stuck with F8. So within four shots, I got it going. But here's what's cool. Even though this photo, again, is like way underexposed, you could see all the details here on the left. Again, I could raise up this exposure. And all of a sudden, I've got a photo that's in line with some of the other photos that I took where I actually like the exposure. So it was a three, around a three stop difference. So you're able to basically like play around with getting the lighting the way that you want it. And you could even like those, uh, those like intermediate shots that you're working on, they still could potentially be images that you end up working on and having retouched. So we'll hit one here, kind of keep scrolling through these. After I get through this set here, I'll go to the, uh, questions because I want to make sure I'm not losing any of you. Let's see. Number one, again, kind of going through these a little slow just because I'm trying to explain this to you guys as I'm kind of doing it. You guys weren't here watching kind of like watching over my shoulders. I'd be like going through this really, really fast, but let's see. That's good. And really what I'm trying to do is to find like, find a really interesting expression. Some of these you're probably seeing and you're like, oh wow, that's a really good shot. But you know, as you kind of go through these, you'll know like, okay, I remember the photo shoot. I remember which ones, as I saw them through the viewfinder, which ones were like, oh wow, that's gonna be a good one. So kind of looking for those shots right now. But sometimes when you see them on the screen, you're surprised that uh, you'll see a shot that you didn't even remember that you took. 
So, all right. So I'm going to stop here at this point. Let me look at the uh, questions here really quickly before we go to the last look. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Let's see. Okay. Mo says, uh, Miguel, also I've used Affinity Photo and it's nearly as good as Capture One for people who do not want to pay the subscriptions for Adobe and are unfamiliar with Capture One. Uh, I've tried Affinity Photo in the past and, uh, you know, it is, it is definitely an option as far as raw processing, but, you know, to be really honest with you, um, I still prefer Capture One for my raw processing. Um, I don't know. I, I, I haven't had very, very much good luck with uh, Affinity Photo and with Luminar, but, you know, again, it's like everyone's mileage will vary. <laughs> so I would say, you know, definitely try out Capture One if you haven't tried it out recently, because I know for me, for everything that I do with my workflow, with um, just everything, in my process, I would still prefer to use Capture One. Uh, K. Paris says, I can see you in the eyes. Yes, you can actually. If I zoom in here, hey, who's that guy right there? That is me. That is a pro photo, a silver umbrella bouncing into a white V flat. Got a silver reflector below. Got a white studio, white studio uh, ceiling. So some of the slide is just bouncing around and that's how we're getting this uh, set up. And again, if you watch the live stream that I shared about two weeks ago, you'll see exactly the, uh, the light setup for this. Uh, Caleb was asking, how is STF different than other lenses? It's very different. Uh, it's a little bit complicated to explain. Uh, I actually have a video that I've, I've already written the like details, like the scripting for this video. And uh, it's just a matter of just sitting down and having time to knock out these videos. But kind of the, the short answer is that these STF lenses have basically your regular lens element, and then it has another lens in the back side of the lens that is essentially like a graduated neutral density filter. So imagine in the center of this little lens, it's clear. And as it kind of goes out towards the edges of that lens, it progressively gets darker. So what ends up happening is if you're shooting at f2.8, the center of the lens, you have your, your f2.8 you know, light, that amount of light coming through. But on the edges of that lens, of that aperture, it gets darker. So what's really neat is that if you're shooting anywhere from f2.8 to f5.6 with that lens, you're going to get this beautiful, blurry background. So if you're shooting outdoors, you're just going to get gorgeous background blur with that lens. However, if you're shooting in the studio and you're shooting at f8, f11, f14, f16, this lens is crazy sharp. Like it's not as sharp as the 90 macro. So if you're going for like the ultimate in sharpness, then you're probably going to want to use something like the 90 uh, 2.8G macro. However, the 100 STF, it's like just a notch below the 90 macro in sharpness, but it's super, super detailed. Like I tend to probably use the 100 STF, maybe like 65% of my beauty and portrait shoots, I'll end up using that lens. And I've actually had entire photo shoots where that's the only lens that I'll end up using. Uh, back in the day, the 85 used to be that lens for me that I would do like most of my photo shoot with the 85 mil lens. And I would say since the 100 STF came out, that one has like, I don't know, I just kind of fell in love with that 100 millimeter focal length. I feel like it makes people's faces look really good. And then the best part is just that it's really, really sharp. So I'll have a full video coming out. I did a, I did a video a few months ago, maybe it was last month, that was the best Sony lenses for portraits. And I talked about the 90 macro. I'm planning on doing an entire series of all of my favorite portrait lenses. And that 100 STF is going to have its own video, its own details, its own explanations. And uh, yeah, you'll get to uh, uh, see some more about that. So let's see. Uh, Fernando was saying, what percentage do you use Capture One versus Photoshop? Uh, let's see. Is most of your editing done in Capture One? So um, I would say that most of the retouching or most of my process I would do like the raw processing in uh, in Capture One, and then and that's like a hundred percent of the time. And then what'll end up happening is it'll go from Capture One directly to Photoshop. 
So it's not really like a capture one versus Photoshop because for every image, they see both programs. Like they'll see Capture One for a period of time and then it's gonna see Photoshop for a period of time because I'm processing, I'm doing the uh, color correction and um, you know highlight and shadow recovery, uh, playing with the clarity, things of that nature. I'm doing all of that in Capture One. And then once I have a decent looking RAW file, then I kick it over to Photoshop and then that's where the skin retouching and uh, things of that nature. And even at times, I'll actually do some color grading within Capture One. So it just depends. Uh, e each image is different. Sometimes uh, sometimes I'll stay, like, let's say from zero to 100%, right? So I might have an image 20% of the time in Capture One until I get it looking good, and then I bring it to Photoshop and then finish the last 80%. Sometimes I'll take an image and I'll be 50% in Capture One, and it'll look pretty doggone good. And then I'll bring it over to Photoshop and I'll do the last 50%. So it, it changes, like it varies, but it's not one versus the other. It's like in conjunction with, if that makes sense. Uh, so most of the editing is not done in Capture One. Um, it's, it's really just a part of the process, uh, but it always, like every single one of my images will see Capture One for some period of time before it's actually like all done. Uh, Larry the Photox says, uh, well, it looks like he was talking to uh, to Fernando here. Um, Wendy says, personal work as opposed to uh, professional, do you print your own work? Um, I mean, I assume you're talking about in terms of, uh, well, I, I, I guess you're talking in terms of printing. Um, I don't print my own work that often. Uh, I do have a printer. And I have printed some images on occasion, but to be honest, like I go to the store so often that I tend to get prints made. So um, I use Adorama Pix to print images if I'm uh, going into the city. Sometimes I'll go to uh, Unique Photo here in New Jersey. They have a, a print service here. And so if I'm picking up something else at the store, I'll get prints done there. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I usually don't print my own images, but uh, I do have printers here in the event that, I don't know, if I want to print something out and give it to someone that's here, like right on the spot, I have it ready to go. Uh, Steven was asking, what skin retouching techniques are you currently using, frequency separation or local dodge and burn? Um, I tend to do like healing and cloning on a blank layer, and then I do um, global and micro dodge and burn. So use both. Uh, Roberto says, how do you stop your photos from coming out on your computer and your camera at the same time when tethering to Capture One? Within your Sony camera, if you're using the A7R, uh, A7R3 or the A7 III, there's a, actually, let me grab my camera and I could tell you. So if you go to your setup, setup menu, so you hit menu, go to setup, and there's an option on page four that says PC remote settings. And then the first thing you'll see, it says still image, save destination. You could change that to PC only or PC and camera. Now, I tend to have mine set to both uh, just for redundancy. Like I like having it on my laptop and I like having it on the SD card, uh, mainly because I edit on my laptop, but I also have a, a like a big workstation PC, which that's where ultimately all of these photos will get saved. So, um, you know, I, I, I save it on both basically. Uh, let's see. Um, Clayton says, how is Capture One with cataloging, if possible, compared to Lightroom? Uh, I, For me, it does great. I think it's like super simple for me because let me kind of like show you guys here. Um, let me go to folder. All right. So let me figure out how I can share my screen here. Uh, let's add a... Give me a second here. We're going to find window capture. Okay. And we'll show you my explorer window. All right. So you guys should hopefully see. All right. So now you see my explorer window. Um, you could see that basically. So when I set up that new session, you see how it says January 30th photo shoot. You can go back to that. 
So you see January 30th photo shoot. So what will end up happening is underneath whatever the folder or whatever hard drive, I'll have like January 30th shoot or I'll do it like this was the Spider-Man photo shoot. So like, again, all of the images from that photo shoot are all here in this capture folder. So you can see basically all of the images there. What I end up doing, and I'll show you guys that process in this photo shoot as I'm working through it, but what I'll end up doing is all of the selects that I end up retouching, like that I end up working on, they end up in this selects folder. So obviously if you're looking for the pictures that you picked out from that photo shoot, you don't want to have to go into this capture folder where you have all of these images. So what I end up doing is the raw files that I edit will go into the selects folder and then in output, this is where all of the images, and this is really sloppy, so don't <laughs> don't use this as your example because this one was like super sloppy. But usually in this folder, I'll have three folders. I'll have an edits folder that has all of the PSDs. So like all of the images that I basically, once I'm done with them from Photoshop, they get saved in this edits folder. Then uh, I'll have a delivery folder and inside of that delivery folder, these are all of the high-res JPEGs that I end up sending to the uh, client or to the model. Um, so these are all, uh, basically, this was from that Spider-Man shoot, which I'd have to share this window. And apparently it doesn't show you guys, but yeah. So these are all the ones that I delivered. And then I'll have a web folder. And usually inside of the web folder, all of those JPEGs that I delivered... I'll make a web-sized PNG file, and then this is the ones that I actually share via Instagram or via Facebook or whatever else. Um, this one I was working on on two different computers, and uh, I was kind of working quickly because we did the photo shoot, and then I had to edit the videos quickly for the video, and then that video was being posted like two days later, so I wasn't trying to be, you know... Uh, trying to be like clean about how I organized all of this stuff, but generally speaking, that's how I would go about doing it. So let me go back here to take this off here. So window capture number two, take me back to capture one. There we go. All right, so you guys should be seeing uh, capture one once again, hopefully. And I'll go back to the questions here. Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. Um, Mike says, uh, while we're on your software, could we please see it before and after? As a new photographer, it works. It's sometimes hard to know if I have a good shot to work with. Um, so part of what I'm doing now is kind of showing you what the before looks like. Um, the afters, what I would tell you is there is one shot that basically got like got through this process. Uh, if you go onto my Instagram, go on Instagram.com forward slash at Miguel Quiles Jr. If you just search Miguel Quiles Jr. on Instagram, you'll see one of the photos from this photo shoot and you'll see what it looks like when it's all done. To be honest with you, the final images don't look that much different. Uh, most of what you're going to see it's actually done in Capture One. A lot of it is like exposure changes, um, white balance changes, things of that nature. Um, they usually don't look that much different. With the exception of like, let's say that one shot where it was like totally underexposed. You know, obviously that photo, I'm not going to retouch it like that and just upload it as a, you know, over or underexposed shot. That will get worked on at some point in the process. But, um, yeah, so I might actually do some before and afters later on. Because um, let me see, on this computer, let me see if I have some before and afters that I could show you guys. Don't believe that I do. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I don't really have any before and afters on this computer. So... Yeah, unfortunately, that'll have to be a video for a different day, but uh, it's a good question. Let's take a look here. Um, all right, so Ryan was asking, if you could only choose one lens, would it be the 90 macro or the 100 STF? Um, geez, man, that's a tough one. I personally would probably go with the 100 STF just because I think it's more versatile. 
um, and it's not as sharp, so it's a little more forgiving. So I, I would go for the 100, but you know, the, the thing is that with photography, it's very much like any other trade. You know, if you hire somebody to work on your house, for example, and all they did was show up with a hammer to do the job, I mean, there are some things that they'd be able to get done with a hammer just fine, but they wouldn't be able to do the complete job. They wouldn't be able to tackle everything that could possibly be thrown at them if all they had was a hammer, right? So when it comes to photography, it's very similar. Like the 90 macro and the 100 STF are two different tools that you would use in different scenarios. And I don't think one takes the place of the other. Um, but, you know, if I'm in a vacuum and I could only choose one, I probably would choose the 100 STF personally. So let's see. Um, Rick was saying that it's snowing in Brooklyn. Nice to have you on. Yep, it's good to be on, man. Glad you guys are listening. Uh, let's see. Vince was saying, what's up? Uh, Mac was saying, can you share your export process workflow for the web and social media? I actually made a video on my YouTube channel that uh, kind of details and walks through that process of how I do that. Um, scroll through, it's probably like from six months ago. But if you go on my channel and go to the videos, you'll see the video there. It's something like how I upload for uh, Facebook. And it's the same process whether I'm uploading for Instagram or whatever else. So anyway, let's get back to Capture One. Let's let's look at these shots. Um, we're going to go to this look here, which uh, nobody has seen up to this point. We, we haven't shown any of these images yet. So um, I'll kind of show you guys here this uh, this look. We, we did something very similar on uh, one of the episodes of, actually the only episode that we shot so far called The Look. And, uh, you know, we were kind of playing around with different colored flowers and different makeup. So that's kind of what you're seeing here. Uh, different lighting as well. So again, I'm just going to go through these relatively quickly. Just push uh, the number one for any of the shots that I think look interesting. Let's see. Again, just thumbing through these because I want to kind of buzz through the process here a little bit quicker. So again, just kind of looking through these, and you'll notice that as they're pulling up, they kind of show up a little bit blurry. Uh, it does take a second for it to like sharpen. So if you see that, that's totally normal. Okay, going through these again, just looking at those expressions, hitting the number one. I would be going through these a lot quicker. Like when I mean a lot quicker, I'm gonna start at the beginning here. I would go like this and literally just thumb through these like super fast. And the key is that the really good shots will stop you and you'll go back to it. And if you feel like, uh, maybe I was wrong, then you just kind of keep going and just go quickly. So this is usually what I end up doing with every single photo shoot as I'm trying to figure out which are the ones that uh, I'm gonna have worked on. This is how it's done. It should be really quick. You shouldn't really be spending too much time thinking about like anything like, oh, well, what about the hair or, you know, is the makeup correct or is one of the flowers like falling off or is it in the wrong position? Like I'm not thinking about any of that because, again, I can deal with those things in Photoshop in post-production. At this point, I'm just looking at do I have like a raw photo that I want to spend time on that I want to you know, potentially have retouched and potentially show the world. There we go. Getting through these here. That's kind of cool. Can go with that. This one, the lighting setup changed a little bit. I added a uh, kicker light or a hair light. Sometimes that'll happen where I'll have like a whole sequence of shots and then I'll add a light or I'll gel a light or something like that. And then I'm like, okay, well, I guess, um, I guess, uh, like I have to pick which one is the best, you know, and some of the, like, for example, if I put out images here, it could be very possible when I get to the very end and I've cut this down to like five shots that I'm going to deliver that either I'll select all of the shots that have the kicker light or I'll select all the shots that don't have it. Like, I usually don't do one or the other. Um, that's just me. All right. 
So we'll go back to this folder icon here, and you see that uh, ah, today's a hard day, man. I went from 279 to 79. So now I'll click on that 79, and we'll go back up to the top. And now I kind of go through these again very quickly to see which one of these do I like. Like these are the best of the bunch, right? These are the 79 best out of 279 images. So now my goal is to cut this in half. And I do it the I do it the exact same way. I basically just thumb through the images and look at these, look at the expression, and is it one that I think would uh, make for a great shot? And if so, I just hit the number two because I want to give it two stars to separate it from the rest of the one stars. So we'll go through these. And it actually gets a little bit easier at this step because sometimes you'll see some shots that uh, compared to the ones prior, like when you see them compared to a bunch of other shots that may have not been as good, uh, sometimes like mediocre shots look a little bit better than they probably should. But when you get to this point, sometimes it gets really obvious like which are the really good shots. So might even be able to do better than cutting it in half, but we will see. See, like this shot here, when I compare good, like a, for me, what's a good portrait, like these three, this one's okay, this one's all right, this one for me isn't as great, like that one's okay, that's okay, you know, so out of these, like I would say, and then I also look at them on the thumbnail side, so on this uh, right hand side, I'll look at these thumbnails here, so I see them big, and then I see them small, and if they look good as a small thumbnail, chances are when I see them large, they're going to look pretty good as well. So like this one for me is a maybe. We'll put a two on that. Just keep going through these. This is a maybe. Uh, kind of like that. Off that. Uh, yep, those are good. Those are good. That's good. You'll notice too, like I don't have a lot of photos where people are smiling. Um, you know, for some clients, like if, if let's say if she hired me to take her portraits and she specifically wanted a photo where she was smiling, this is a fine, like a really nice uh, smiling portrait. But for beauty, for uh, fashion work and things of that nature, you typically don't have people smiling. So even though this is a really nice portrait, I'm not gonna choose that one. We'll choose that. I love this one. Kind of like that, but I'm going to let that one go. Let's go through the rest of these here. So like between these two, you notice the engagement. She's a lot more engaged in uh, this file versus this one. So like I'll give that one the uh, two star bump. Then we'll go through these like the uh, showing the makeup on that one. Let's see, go through the rest of these here. I like that. From the close-ups, kind of like that. Like that one. Like that. This one, this one, this one. All right, so we cut it from 79 to 27. So we're doing really, really good. Um, and again, the goal is by the time we hit five stars that we only have five images. That's it. And it gets much, much easier as we kind of go through these. So kind of going through the uh, black background ones. So really, actually, let's back up for a sec. So we have, at this point, we have some images on black. We have some images on dark brown, which is really the same background. It's just not as much light as hitting the background, so it appears darker brown. But just for the sake of argument, we have a black background, dark brown, light brown, and pink. So we have four different, um, four different backgrounds. Now, ideally, out of four different backgrounds, what I would like to do is to have one image, like the best image from each one. And if one of the four different backgrounds has like an exceptional second image, then that will round out, like that'll make it that fifth image that I end up selecting. So what I really wanna do is find the best of each of these backgrounds 
And then if there's like a tie and there's two that are different enough, then there'll be two of one color and one of the rest, if that makes sense. We go to the questions here really briefly just to see if you guys have any questions. Um, so Doug was asking, I have the Zeiss 85 mil. Do you think it's worth it to get the 100 STF? I mostly shoot in studio portraits. Um, so, so if you have the Battis 85, 85, I would tell you that the 100 STF is quite a bit sharper. Um, I would say it would be worth getting the 100 STF. Like I have the 85 G Master. I had the 85 Battis and I actually sold it and got the 8518 from Sony because they're really comparable. I mean, they look... Like, like if you take a photo with each lens, lens they, they look really, really similar. And the Sony lens is like half the price. price. So <laughs> I sold the Battis while it was still worth something. We basically bought the Sony lens. And then I think I bought, oh man, what did I get? I picked up some other lens at the time. I can't really remember. I'm sure it'll hit me at some point. But I basically sold one lens to buy two. And I still had an 8518 that was like ridiculously good so much so that i actually use the 8518 more than i use the 85g master these days and i think part of that is just being lazy like i, I the weight difference is so crazy that like i'll end up using the 8518 over the uh, g master just just because of that so uh benjamin is saying that there's an echo let me know if you guys are still hearing that echo Trying to figure out if it's happening because I'm talking too far from the microphone or what it is. Uh, Wendy was saying, did I miss info about the pink background? Uh, here's the pink background shots. And actually, it's funny. Uh, this savage background is called coral, I believe. So it's not, I mean, to me, it's pink. But yeah, this is what I would call the pink background. I'm not sure how it's showing up there, but... Yeah, yeah, so, so some, some people are saying that there's definitely an echo. echo. I'm going to play with this microphone setting. Let, let me know if uh, if, if this echoing is any better at this point. point. So, so I'll keep, keep going, going here. Let me know. So, so saying that there's a slight echo. echo. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of curious what that is. Let me see. Hmm. I'm going to disconnect my headphones here. I'm curious if maybe the, the microphone and the microphone that's on the headphones is what's causing that. So let's disconnect the headphones. Okay, so let me know if the echoing changed at all. I just disconnected my headset, so I can't hear myself, so I don't know how loud I am. But hopefully you guys can hear me. Paul was saying it's not as bad as it was earlier. Good. All right. Cool deal. That didn't fix it. Okay, so if that didn't fix it, I'm putting my headphones back on because I kind of want to hear. Let's see, I think it's not going to be a huge issue, and I think it would be better to continue. Cool. All right, I agree. I do think it's better to continue. All right, so now we're at the two stars. Let's go up to the top. Um, at this two-star process, this is where I actually will zoom into the image, and I want to make sure that the shots are in focus. Now, if, for example, and this doesn't happen, but let's just play like devil's advocate here. If I was to go through these black background images and I zoom into all of them and the eyes are out of focus on every single one of them, they will not be candidates for like going through the process of being retouched and delivered. Like it, it, that's, that's out of the question. The eyes have to be sharp and in focus in these shots if they are going to kind of like move forward in the process. So what I'll end up doing is, for example, if all of these shots on the black background were out of focus, I would go back to the one stars and I would try to find images on the black background where the eyes are in focus. Because at that point, that's really the only option that I have, right? Like I'm not going to put out an image that the eyes are not in focus. So we're gonna zoom into the eyes here and we'll take a look at these here and see. So again, it takes a moment for the image to kind of like sharpen. These are 42 megapixel files, and that's why it does take a moment for, uh, you know, for Capture One to basically like go from it being blurry to being nice and sharp and detailed. So I'll zoom in on the eyes. This image is sharp enough. Go to this shot. That image is crazy sharp. This one is sharp. 
that's sharp. And again, this is using eye autofocus on the A7R3. So I have to give it up to the uh, camera in this case as far as getting the eyes in focus. That's sharp. That's sharp. This is sharp. So you can see out of all the picks that I've made so far, these are all really sharp, super detailed. Thank goodness. <laughs> This one's a little tiny bit soft. I mean, not terribly. I mean, that looks sharp enough for me, but it's a little bit soft in the corners here. And I think that's just because of the uh, the lens, and I'm shooting this at f8. So, like, here in the corner of the eye, it's a little bit soft, but the actual eye itself is uh, nice and sharp, so that's okay. I can go with that. Uh, this one is super sharp. That's super sharp. That is sharp. That's sharp. This one is good. Let's see. Mac was asking, do you turn face detect off on IAF? I think I actually keep them on, because if it doesn't detect the eye, it'll detect the face. And usually at F8, um, or F9, or F11, or F14, I mean, I jumped all over the place with the aperture on these shots, but usually... Um, It'll, if it doesn't get the eyes in focus, it'll get the face, and most of the time you're pretty good. So uh, These, by the way, if you notice, this is at f5.6, so that's why you're going to notice that now the nose is blurry, but the eyes should still be in focus using the IAF. So that's good, and that's super sharp. Whoa, what is this? Oh, there we go. We'll zoom in here. That is sharp. So, so far, it looks like every single shot in this two-star bin, every single one is in focus. It took 279 photos. I randomly cut it to 27. This might be the first photo. And it looks like what happened is it focused on the back eye instead of the, the closest eye. So this photo, unfortunately would not make the cut for me. Just based off of that one thing, whenever the model or the subject has their face turned away from the camera, that near eye has to be in focus, for me personally. If the back eye is in focus and that near eye is blurry, that's a no-go for me. So this one is pretty easy. I'll just hit the number one. It gets rid of that. It'll put it back in the number one bin. See how easy that is? We just cut it from 27 to 26. Right, just by looking to see if they're uh, sharp and in focus. Now, this shot, this is another one where, let's see, I'm waiting for it to fully process here. So this one looks like it's slightly missed. To be honest with you, like it focused a little bit more on the hair, these little eyelashes here, than it did on the actual eye. But if you're zoomed out like that, you probably couldn't tell the difference, but I can. <laughs> so this one's not going to make the cut for me. So I'm going to hit the number one. And this doesn't happen very often. Like here, this one's perfect. Uh, this one, hopefully, because I like this one a lot. This one is good. All right. So we cut it from 27 to 25 really quickly just by looking to see which one of these were sharpen and focus and uh, we'll start back at the top with these black background shots and i really love that one i keep coming back to that so i'm going to hit the number three i'm going to hit the number three skip that skip that um hmm kind of iffy on this one i'm going to hit the number three anyway just because we still have another round of cuts uh, let's see, going through these, I like that one, but let's see. All right, so from the dark background, we have one, two, three, four. I would say I like that. That's going to be a three. And of the ones looking off to the side, if I hit control, or if I hold down control and click on these two photos, I can see them side by side. It makes it a little bit easier because they're both relatively similar in terms of how she's posing. Um, man, they're really, really close, actually. <laughs> the only difference really is her head 
appears a little bit bigger on the right. And that's possibly because I cut in a little bit closer with the 100. And I actually like that better. So I'm going to say that one's going to get a 3. Now we have these light brown background shots. So out of these, we'll uh, start here. I uh, like that one. And I like the close-up. All right. And then uh, from the pink background, I don't know what it is about this shot. I really like this one. It's, it's odd. Like, it's different. The expression is different. The mood is different. I kind of dig this one. I'm going to give this one a three. I like this one. This one I'm not as crazy about. Uh, this one I like a lot. All right, so we've cut these down now to 10. So these are our top 10 shots. So again, what I'm looking to do is to find the best of these images on the black and then just find that one extra shot on one of these different backgrounds that's going to look good. So looking at these three, I'm actually going to go to you guys in the comment section. Let me know. Uh, from these three on the black background, and I'll I'll do this. All right, so we have, and actually no, hold on, let me let me fix this. <laughs> so I'm gonna go to the exposure tab. I'm gonna bring up the exposure on this one just to make it a little more comparable. What I don't want you to do is to look at these and think, well, I like the exposure on one and not the other, because like that could be changed. So just looking purely at the expression between one, two, and three, let me know in the comment section, which one do you like best? Do you like one, two, or three? And I'll tell you which one I picked. So we'll see, we'll see who gets this. Um, so just pick one, two, or three. So from left to right, left image is one, middle image is number two, right image is number three. Let me know. I'm going to read the questions here while you guys are telling me which ones you guys like. Uh, Brandon was saying mouth is softer on the right. I think that was the one that was the larger kind of like cropped in shot. And I do agree with you. Um, that was why I picked that one. Uh, Bayou just joined. He says, hi, Miguel. How's it going? Um, Max says, I think I like this one best. Talking about 857, which is image number three. Uh, K. Parrot was saying number one. Mikey says number two. Doug says number one. Brandon says one and three. Uh, looks like there's a lot of people picking one. Paul says number two. Um, let's see. One looks more symmetrical. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of could go with that. Um, Mac is saying two is nice too. <laughs> uh, Paul says two is strange in a good way. Yeah. Christine is saying two all day. All right, so looks like most of you guys have sounded off uh, Justin saying number three. So I'm going to tell you which one my gut went with. So when I looked at these three shots, my gut, very, very beginning, went with number two. Partly because, and somebody else said this, that, you know, it's strange in a good way. You kind of want... Your and, and for me, and I'm, I'm saying this for myself, with my portrait work, when I'm selecting an image, I want a look that looks good, but that looks different. I don't want the expression to be very, how, how could I put it? I don't want the expression to be common, right? Because what ends up happening is if somebody is looking at an image online and they're scrolling, if you see like a common expression, you just scroll right past that. It's like, eh, yeah, whatever. You know, they, they like, you've seen people look like this a million times before. But the one in the middle, she's saying something with her expression. I'm not quite sure what it is, but as a viewer, I want to look at the photo to try to figure out what it is. And that, for me, is what I want as a portrait photographer. I want it to grab the person and hold their attention and even if they walk away from that experience saying, you know, I looked at it and I don't think I really like it, that's totally okay. Like, I've already won because I managed to take someone's attention in this world that, you know, like we're, we're trained, our, our 
brain has been like wired in such a way that we're used to just scrolling past stuff that as a portrait photographer, if I can get you to stop for a second and just stop and look at my photo, I've already won. Like I've already accomplished my goal. So I feel like number two for me, if I look at the three, number two does that for me because she just looks like she's communicating a story with her expression. However, I would say number one, from a lighting perspective, like that one to me looks statuesque. (laughs) Um, You know, like if this was like back in Greek times and they were going to build like a stone um, sculpture of her face, I would imagine they would use picture number one to do it because it it just looks great. But I don't know. Number two for me is going to be my pick. But because we're at the three star process right now, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to put image number one. I'm going to give that one four stars. And image number two is going to get four stars because, again, one of these different backgrounds, I'm going to have two images, right? So maybe it's it's going to be be on the black background. background. Who Who knows? knows? Uh, While while I I love love this one, one, I I don't don't know. It's still too common for me to take take the time to work on the image. So hopefully that makes sense to everybody. That's That's my thought process. process. You're probably thinking I'm crazy. If you think I'm crazy, let me know in the comments. But yeah, it's going to be number two or number one. Let's go to these two images. We'll put these two side by side. Let me know in the comments, image number one or image number two. Which one do you think should make the cut? And then I'll look at the uh, comments here from what you guys were saying afterwards. So um, let's see. Yes, that's true. It's not a common pose. Very true. K. Paris says, I understand you. Uh, expression should be unique and different. I totally agree. Totally agree. hundred percent. Clayton says, you crazy. I know. I know. That's how it is. <laughs> K. Paris is looking off camera. It was his pick. So we got a bunch of people saying number two. We have uh, Joseph saying number one. Yeah, I, I think this one for me is pretty easy. I think number two looks really, really interesting. Um, Max says the same thing. Number one looks generic, so I would go with number two. See, you're already you're already thinking like me. I'm sorry. I apologize for making you do that. But um, I really like number two. I like that expression. It looks like she's looking through a window or something. I don't know. It's just a really interesting face, really interesting expression. Uh, Roberto was saying he doesn't like either, to be honest. I I get that. You know, sometimes there's there's going to be shots that you may not like. And, you know, it's okay. I would say after going through this process, I feel pretty good now that uh, these are the two best ones from the dark brown background. So, you know, it's either going to be one of these two or I wouldn't do one at all. And I actually do like the image on the right quite a bit better. So we'll give that one a number four. Uh, Here's with the light brown background. Which one do you guys like? Number one or number two? Look at the uh, look at the comments here. Feel like one missed the eye contact, like number two. Totally agree. Um, let's see. Uh, no need to see the camera to tell story. Uh, the expression with her mouth open looks more appealing. All right, so now we're looking at these two images. We've got a few people saying number one. Some are saying number two. Uh, some say expression in her eyes, number one. Some say number two is more compelling, I think. <laughs> K. Paris says, I squinted. I like the chin in number one. Yeah. Um, so for me on these two shots, I'm going to say, and this is a really, really tough one. I personally like number two better. Um, and, and I'll explain to you why. So number one is fine. Uh, what, what I what I'm not crazy about with this shot is that this left eye, because I shot this at f5.6, the far eye is out of focus. I don't mind that. That's not like a total deal breaker for me. Um, there's going to be some people who would tell you both eyes have to be in focus, but if that was the case, then I couldn't have shot it at f5.6. I would have had to have shoot you know shot that at like f11 or something like that, and that's not what I ended up doing for this shot because I wanted to get kind of like a 3d look to the face so 
far away, that shot looks fine. It's sharp. Um, she does have like a very kind of like engaging expression. But for me, number two, because her eyes are on the same focal plane, both eyes are going to be really sharp and in focus, which I like. Uh, more of her skin is going to be in focus, which I really like. And I also think that, I don't know, man, it's something about the expression. Like both of these have like a really good engaged expression, but I feel like, I don't know. I feel like number two, you know, you're going to stare at both photos, but I'd probably stare at number two a little bit longer because I think it's just has a little bit more of an engaging expression. So that one is going to get four stars. And now here's the tough one. Or maybe it's easy. I don't know. Let me actually change the exposure on this third one just a touch, just so that you guys see it, you know, see them to where they're a little bit more comparable to one another. So here's one, two, three. So here you go. <laughs> Wendy says, I like number one, but you'll like number two. <laughs> hey, you know, it's okay. Like we, uh, we can, we can uh, differ on our, on our picks here. You know, I, I like vanilla ice cream on a waffle cone. You'll probably think I'm like super boring, but, uh, you know, you might go to the ice cream place and like, uh, Neapolitan or strawberry or whatever. That's, that's how it goes, but it's cool though. You guys get to see kind of like how my mind works and how I go about picking images. And then you can imagine like when I post up an image on social media, imagine the other photos that don't get posted. Like there's usually some really, really good shots that, uh, never get to see the light of day because, you know, I just looked at it and I felt like some other shots were better. So it just happens that way, you know? So out of these, which ones, which ones do you guys pick? Let me go back to it here. So uh, Ashley was saying she loves number three with the flowers. A uh, bunch of people saying number one, a few people saying number two. Roberto says one, definitely. One is great. <laughs> Max says, this is tough. Welcome to my life. You know, part of this, like, it's really hard. So having you guys watching my uh, live stream today and kind of like chiming in does help a little bit. But yeah, you guys kind of see what my pain is when I finish a photo shoot to try to pick. It's like, ugh, it's a lot of work. Um, let's see, Max says, I just like that look in the eyes on three. Uh, one, the lips, like, want to say something. Yep. Uh, let's see, I'd pick one, but two feels more flattering if the model was your client. Uh, let's see, it looks like mannequin, but in a good way. I like the mood in number two and expression, don't like the mouth in number one. Uh, three has more emotion in it, my personal opinion. Okay, so looking at these three photos, um, I could agree with the people on the first shot. I do feel like it looks kind of mannequin-ish, but that's not a bad thing for this type of photo. Like this style in, in close-up kind of like beauty photography, uh, there are some shots that clients will want where people look like a mannequin. Like that's a very common thing. Um, I love the catch lights in all three of these. I really like how the catch lights look in the first one. And the second image, I feel like it looks okay. What I'm not crazy about is the way that I crop the hair on the right side of that frame. Um, if I were, it, you know, in a perfect world, if I was to have retaken this image, I would have cropped it over just a little bit more to the right. But I do think that her eyes, like she's got a fantastic connection with the camera in that second shot. Um, this would probably be one that if I did pick it, I would crop it. Um, and then image number three for me, the way that it's cropped in the camera, I, I love it. I mean, I think it's got like a really beautiful look. She's got a great expression. Um, it likely won't be number one for me. I'm going to look at image number two and what I'm going to do is crop it and just see if, you know, by cropping this a little bit, if that kind of changes my perspective on, uh, which, which shot to go with. Um, if you guys are ever wondering, by the way, how I go about cropping a shot like this, if you guys notice on this cropping tool, you have basically the rule of thirds, right? You have your tic-tac-toe grids. What I'll end up doing is I make this top line on the rule of thirds grid intersect with the eyes. So it doesn't really matter, 
Like this is kind of a simple thing for me, but this is how I go about cropping images. So I'm going to put that line right across the eyes and we'll hit the hands to basically crop in. And now this one is a little bit better for me. Um, we'll compare this to number three. Tell me what you guys think. I mean, it's still, hmm. Yeah, this is tough. This bottom left hand corner is kind of bothering me compared to the right where it's like flowers from left to right. The fact that her shoulder is not going all the way on the left is kind of irking me a little bit, but I do like this crop a lot better. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give both of these a number four. And now we're going to go to the fours and we have six images. All right, six shots. We're, these are the best of 279 photos. We've had a, a long journey today. So here are the six photos. Now, looking at these six photos, we have two images on the black background and we have two images on pink. Obviously, the brown background images, both of those are going to make the cut. Um, the question is, one, two, three, or four, which one would you get rid of? if it was you. So which one of these would go? One, two, sorry, one, two, five, or six, because three or four, they're both going to make it. So let me know which one you guys think. And I'll go back to the uh, comments here. Um, you could tell she enjoyed this session with the flowers on pink. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a lot of fun. Like, can you imagine, like, it, th that look probably took maybe, like, 40, 45 minutes to just like glue each of those individual flowers on her. So it took a little while to get her uh, just with the flowers to stick to her, let alone to get the makeup done and all of that. So um, yeah, she had, a, she had fun. I had fun. Uh, let's see. A lot of people are saying number one, that they would drop number one. Um, it says one looks like an ID card photo, but a hundred dollar one. <laughs> Yeah, that's an expensive ID card photo, I'll tell you that. Um, I think number one reminds me of a shot for New York Fashion Week and her face seems a little scared. Yeah, I can see that. It seems to me like the type of image that you would see in a uh, in like a portfolio. Um, like if you go to the agency's website and you would see the, the model's portrait, that looks like a shot that you would see there. Um, so let's see. Yeah, it looks like uh, they're saying one or five should go but it looks like the majority of you are saying number one should go yeah i i kind of feel like that especially so you see you see what i'm talking about number one looked really really good up until we got to this four star section and now we're comparing like the best of the best from each uh each look and each background and now it gets really easy to look at these and say okay yeah i don't know which one it's going to be um, number one to me does look a little bit stoic, her expression. It's, there's not as much going on as there is in number two or number five or six. I feel like the two pink background shots, she has a lot going on in those expressions. And I do think that the two shots on pink are different enough that I wouldn't feel bad posting two photos from that pink set, if that makes sense. Like the one on black, they look very similar. Not super similar, but they're more similar than the two pink background ones. So I'm I'm gonna go up here to select. I'm gonna deselect all. We're gonna go to number one. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give this a, actually, I'm not gonna give it anything. These other shots, I'm gonna give this five. So all the remaining photos get a five. That one shot will stay all by itself in the four stars. So here are the five star images that will graduate. These are all gonna graduate, capture one university. These are gonna go and uh, be retouched and ultimately get posted online at some point. So definitely keep an eye out for that. But what I end up doing is I'll select each of these images. And all I did was just hit control and just select each of those photos. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag from that strip on the right. And of course, it could be on the bottom or the right, depending on how you set it up. And if you hold down on the mouse 
and you can bring these over to the selects folder. So you see how I'm dragging these five photos from capture folder to selects folder. I get a warning that says, are you sure you want to move the selected images? This cannot be undone. Uh, don't show me this message again. I like to live on the wild side. We're going to hit yes. All right. So in, mo in most of my sessions, you're going to see ratings from none to four. And then five star ratings is always going to say zero. And that's because if they're rated five stars, they're going to be in my selects folder. And they're all going to be in that five star section. So these are going to be the images that end up getting retouched. Um, this was from earlier. So we're going to go and take this shot and bring this back to capture folder. All right. So these are the final images. Now they're all in the selects folder. If I go into the selects folder of this session, which let me switch back to show you guys that view here, window capture number two. All right. So you guys should see my folder now. So if I go to January 30th shoots and I go to selects, lo and behold, there are the five images that we've selected. So that's basically where they have landed. And now from here, I would open up or I would let's let's go back. Actually, let me take you back to capture one. I'll show you exactly how I would do this. So we'll turn this off. So what I would end up doing is then I go into the exposure tab on this first image. And now from here, I'll start to make my adjustments. So here, this is where I would go and make my, you know, changes to the white balance, um, changes to the exposure, play around with levels, play around with, um, you know, any, any of the other things that I would do to process this raw file. And then what I end up doing is once it's done, once I've kind of finished that, I just right click, I hit edit with, and then I edit with Adobe Photoshop CC 2019. These are the settings that I personally use. Yours might look different. You might do a TIFF file at 8-bit. You might use sRGB instead of Adobe RGB. I have a uh, HP ZBook that I'm editing these photos on. It's a 10-bit display, and it displays 100% of the Adobe RGB color space. So I like working in that color space because I get to see all of the colors and all the variations in between. But to be honest with you, these photos don't have that much of a variety of color. So I'd be cool with just even doing sRGB. You know, I could go to sRGB and edit that way too. And you probably wouldn't notice the difference. Um, but yeah, and basically from there, it would open up in Photoshop. That's where I would do the skin retouching. It's going to be a video for another day, of course. But uh, let me go back to the comment section here. Let me know what questions you guys have of uh, any of this. And in case you caught this a little bit later, um, if you guys want to try Capture One, you guys can try it for 30 days for free. I have a link in the description for this video. I would invite you guys to uh, click on the link. I don't get any kickbacks or anything from that link. Uh, there's no like codes or anything for me to, um, you know, give me credit for a sale or anything like that. Um, this is just the programs that I enjoy using. Like I love Capture One. So looking through the uh, comments and questions here, uh, some of you guys were saying number one was two squared and emotionless. Four is better than one. Um, exactly for a portfolio shot, of course, that isn't a bad thing either. Yeah, that's why I kind of got rid of number one because it did kind of feel like a portfolio image. Um, and, and it would have been fine, but, you know, kind of went with that. Um, let's see. Clayton says, can you right click and do the move? Uh, well, let's see. If you right click, you can... Yeah, yeah, you, you can, can right click, click Control J, J, move to Selects folder. folder. That, that also works as well. well. Um, you, you know, know I, I really don't, don't always end up doing it that way. way. I, I kind of feel more comfortable just dragging and dropping it because I know for sure it went there. Sometimes, Sometimes when I do keyboard shortcuts, shortcuts they, they they don't always work for me. And maybe that's just bad luck on my end. But then I'll go into the Selects folder and I'm like, hey, I thought I picked five images and there's only four. And it's because I hit control K or something and it went somewhere crazy. So um, let's see. Ashley was saying, you're awesome. Thank you. <laughs> are you going to Sony B&H event tomorrow? Yes, I will. Uh, for those of you who are in the New York, New Jersey, um, 
Pennsylvania, if you're in this area tomorrow at B&H, they're going to have a B Alpha event, uh, five o'clock to nine o'clock. I will be at the event, so I would love to meet some of you guys in person if you're going to be there. Uh, definitely uh, stop by and say hi. Uh, don't be shy, by the way. Uh, I go to some of these events and I'll see people eyeballing me, and I'm just like, man, just come by and say hi. I'm not like, I'm not that scary of a person, even though I sometimes look it. Agnes, by the way, so all of the makeup that you see, the fabulous makeup, the fabulous styling was done by Agnes Barnett. Um, she commented here, she says, can't wait to see these images. And she agreed with number one. Um, yeah, so this is kind of funny. I normally don't do it this way. I normally just pick the images. But um, yeah, it was kind of fun. So Agnes got to follow along and she's the makeup artist. She is the one that uh, glued every single one of these flowers. So um, follow her on Instagram. I'm going to try to type this up here. At a, at a B Glam Looks. So I just typed that in the uh, chat room. Uh, definitely follow her on Instagram. You'll probably notice a lot of her photos look really familiar. That's because we work together all the time. She does fabulous work. Uh, Clayton says, thanks a lot. Ashley says she'll be there. Uh, Frank says, yay, Agnes. Lovely makeup work. Yep, she does really awesome work. So you guys got to kind of see uh, how I go about using Capture One to uh, select my images. I hope that was helpful. I want to ask all of you that are here in this chat room, if you are not subscribed to my YouTube channel, do me a huge favor. I'm trying to hit 30,000 subscribers on YouTube. It's a goal that, um, you know, short-term goal that I set for myself. I'm hoping to hit that before the end of the month. But if you guys are watching this live stream right now and you haven't already subscribed, do me a favor, uh, hit that subscribe button and hit that bell notification. And basically what will happen is I only post one or two times a week, but when I do post, it does notify you. And that way you'll be one of the first people to get to watch the video. Typically in that first hour after I've uploaded a video, I answer questions. So by you being notified, if you have a question about anything during one of the videos, one of the tutorials, whatever the case might be, um, you have a better chance of me responding to your question right away if you actually reply back to the video once it's been posted within that first hour. So definitely subscribe. Um, super appreciate you guys doing that. And um, let's see, just going back through here. Um, yeah, so anyway, I'm going to cut this off at this point. I appreciate you guys joining me for this live stream. And uh, I should have a video posted up on probably Friday. I'm working on a video right now, which hopefully you guys will find very interesting. Um, some of the things that I'm going to talk about in that Friday video, I actually talked about here, but it's going to be a little more like lengthy. So hopefully you guys enjoyed it, and uh, I'll catch you guys on the next video, more than likely on Friday. See you guys later.